So often what we're uh, dealing with in meditation, and in fact why we meditate, is to um, understand and release the mind from hindrance. So it's, it's really one way of one way of defining what meditation is about you know, why why we do it because in the sense of the ongoing activities it's like some of the substructures <coughs> attitudes <coughs> energies <coughs> the mind aren't really revealed or contemplated or um, managed we're just running on them acting on them so in this sense of using meditation as a place of some stillness and introspection um, to bring light upon the uh, conditions of the mind the dominant energies of it of course these are not necessarily should be understood as permanent or as something we are but um, it's a way of highlighting looking more clearly And just also to bear in mind that meditation is only one way, one limb of the path of, of awakening. A very important one, but you know, there's things you can do with right speech and uh, right action that you that uh, also you don't necessarily do with meditation. Right thought, thinking clearly covers both of them actually because right thought thinking clearly thinking what's necessary not thinking what's not necessary <laughs> sustaining it clearly is both good for meditation and good for one's speech and action and livelihood so it's a kind of hinge point really why we begin with meditation with reflection and vitaka vichara it's wise consideration, wise reflection, deep attention, these factors, turning things over, considering what's the meaning of this, what's the real gist of this, what's the bit of this that's bothering me or delighting me, where's that inquiry. This is what we call the whole process of deep, deeply attending. In all the clouds of thought and feeling that arise what's the real nitty-gritty of this and it's never going to be you know we're looking right into where that's acting it's never somebody else is always here it's not delayed in time worry or irritation feeling not enough inadequacy wanting something hungering for something, hungering for contact or affirmation or <coughs> space or whatever. No, this is criminal. It's just, uh, no, this is fundamentally criminal. It's just, you know, that if we're running on the energies that don't aren't appropriate at this time, there's going to be some hindrance, some blocking, some struggling. And to bear in mind that it isn't thinking itself that's a problem, or the source, or it can uh, become a problem, become problematic. It becomes something that obscures our ability to reflect or to have that space, detachment, to contemplate. It's just the incessant, contradictory thinking we're completely involved with. Then it's a hindrance. But thinking itself is not a hindrance. But thinking, right thinking has always got enough silence and space around it to really sense it. So we can sense not just the verbal process, but the emotional pressure undercurrents beneath it or go along with it. The impulse, the pressures, the pushes, the dissonances, the... Uh, panic, the uh, complaining, the 
negativity towards oneself or others, grudging. And these emotions are not, they're problematic, but really even more fundamental than that is the attitudes behind them. So the emotions are just what the mind does when it's placed in the wrong attitudes. Attitude, we can have something, well, then that doesn't work out in truth, that we can identify, we can belong to something, hold something, be something, that doesn't really work out. That other people are something, no, because it's constant change, everything is changing. Future, the past, the present, oneself and others are really just changing references to changing experiences. So only that one can have one doesn't work, and it tends to lock up into frustration and anxiety and so forth. So these really underlying attitudes. That's why, you know, you, you, when you're tackling a hindrance, you come back to not just the thinking, but the thinking, stilling the thinking enough to get to the point of what's the real emotional drive behind that. And then handling that push, that pressure, that emotional drive to say, what, what actually is this based on? My rights or what I feel I should have or should be or should be allowed to have or should never have to be. Where did that come from? Who said that? Mm. You know, he's kind of, I feel on attitude level, my body should be totally painless and healthy all the time. Till I'm 98, whereupon I will just peacefully go to sleep one night and never wake up. That's, but yeah, that's the right attitude, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but uh, that's kind of what one would uh, notice because you're surprised the thing starts breaking down or going strange you, or you feel affronted by it. We haven't really learnt to, to, to acknowledge pain. It's part, it's part, of, part of the deal, part of life. doesn't mean you ignore pain, but you're not really upset by it. Mm. Pain, separation, things breaking down is just part of, that's what happens, isn't it? So just looking at the attitudes, when we feel ourselves suffering, it's some wrong assumption or attitude. Mm. Mental content thoughts and are inconclusive. They're not wrong, but they just never really conclude anything. They go to places where for a moment we, oh, well, that seems about that. And they want to run off to something else to analyze, add up, conclude something else. They never really get to a place of conclusion. They promise it, but they don't arrive there. Figuring things out, planning things, is uh, it's an activity that you participate in and all we can say is well it's pencil isn't it nothing is really definite so once you get this sense of really con understanding mental content it's un it is inconclusive um, emotional surges they're bound to be fluctuating. You can't have a constant, steady emotion. That's their nature. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just that's their nature. If one gets disappointed that they're not always steady and happy and pleasant. Mm. Negativity, depression, being sad, bored, fed up is part of the emotional um, atmosphere. So, you know, you're getting some different attitudes. So that this helps in, in that one's engagement with these phenomena, with mental content, 
is much lighter, much more um, handling it objectively. Feels like this, does this. So it doesn't have the same hindering effect because one isn't stuck in it. Naturally, it's it's uh, helpful to you know to deliberately bring one's mind to bear upon things that can provide helpful mental content. Yet the mind mental habit tends towards the negative by default because it's the negative that we want to push away and avoid. We're protective rather than celebratory creatures. <laughs> yeah. It's the way human beings seem to be. They're looking after, protecting, concerning themselves about what might go wrong rather than really enjoying and appreciating what's okay, what's fine, what's not a problem. What's not a problem doesn't require a lot of mental activity. So the mind kind of seeks activity around what's difficult or problematic or unresolved or unattained yet. And you have to kind of really deliberately reflect and incline the mind. When you keep, you know, ten times for every one negative, you've got to come with through ten of what's not a problem now. Mm. Just to start to work with the habit. And so that the mental content doesn't become obsessive. So we both understand attitudes for what they are, content for what it is. You incline away from unskillful content and you incline towards mental content that is settling, calming, peaceful such as, you know, freedom from pressure, freedom from tax, freedom from obligations, freedom from pain, freedom from physical aggression, freedom from hunger, freedom from disease, you know, the freedoms that are just kind of, we're sitting in. And if any one of those goes, you'd really know it. It would be a powerful source of suffering. And yet when it's not there, it's not a powerful source of celebration. You know, the health one has is just, oh well, hardly noticed. Disease, oh, really noticed. Mm. Freedom from uh, the need to earn a living, not noticed. Mm. But if we were pressurized trying to make ends meet, get enough food, get the bills paid, that will be noticed. Yeah. Freedom from physical violence, not noticed. If there were physical violence, surely we'd notice it. Just note it how, how the mind is angled to not take in and appreciate the non-problematic. This is all part of training, isn't it? So whether you whether deliberately think and reflect and turn to that, because it's not just positive, it's also the mind tends to quiet down because these things that are not problem don't require any mental activity once you turn towards them. There's a moment you can just open up and... Oh yeah, that's nice. Yeah. And then, so it's like a positive quality or a skillful quality that tends towards mental stillness or silence or receptivity. This is skillful thinking, skillful bringing to mind. Like the perception or the, the mind, chitta, awareness, only responds to perceptions and feeling perceptions, impressions, signals, signs. So you have the way to generate signals and signs. 
And signal and sign can be something like, there's a lot to do, we've got a lot to do today, that's a signal, what happens? Mm. You're in agitation. Well, there's a signal and sign in one is welcome, the space, there's encouragement. What's that signal? Signal is different, isn't it? Creating a signal that helps the mind to settle down. So you can deliberately generate signals, impressions, through thinking or through vitaka. Pick up a thought, lift it, hold it there, feel it out. Freedom from, you know, you name the freedoms that you have now. Dwell upon them. You know, it lasts two or three seconds, five seconds maybe, and then the mind jumps again. Acknowledge that. Just turn it back again. If it becomes an obsession, try to contemplate. If you've got an obsessive thing that your mind goes back to, why is this so fascinating? Either negative or craving. Hmm? The emotion. The, and sometimes it's almost as if these more powerful forces of aversion or craving have a, a sort of juicy energy to them. That uh, you're getting bored, or the mind gets dull, it wants something to act upon. So it brings up powerful images or impressions of aversion or regret or craving or worry. And that kind of flushes and it stimulates. Oh, and there's that. Mm. And generally, my uh, my advice would be just to, to disconnect from the the specific topic, the thought, the images, the narratives, and feel the energy of those passions. And in a way, it just gives you some sense of contemplating it and investigate what's this based upon. What's the underlying assumption in terms of having, becoming, getting rid of? And any of those actually valid? Mm. We never really become anything. We never really acquire anything. You know, we can't get rid of things. Things by themselves will tend to dissolve if you don't harbor them. Signal. Positive signals, signal of space. Positive bodily signal, signal of breathing, Sig the sign, the signal of upright, the signal of, you know, simplicity, the earth, the earth element, Sil simple solidity of the body, the simple movement of breathing. <coughs> that signal, that sign, tending the mind to that. Signals, signs, we use, build up to um, <clears throat> get an awareness of the signless. The signless is just uh, open, there's no particular quality, but it's uh, the mind that hungers after signs, after Strong signs, colourful signs, passionate signs, fascinating signs. The sign list remains elusive. But everything we do is to be held with our understanding. The sign list is the supreme. 
So it's not a matter of heaping more and more stuff on your plate, on your meditation plate, so it becomes so full of things you're doing that you don't experience the empty, the open, the, the signless. So we hold in things in balance. Yeah. So even our meditation techniques and themes, you, you don't overdo. It's enough. Enough instilling of signs just to ward away the corrupting influences, the signs, just to give the mind the firmness, just to give provide some clarity, just to give some sense of tuning in, attentiveness. And then what is the sign? What is what is the basis of mind? What is awareness itself? Um, through um, thoughts, passing of thoughts, the awareness of the passing of phenomena. What is that? That medium. Mm. You could say a medium. So this balancing between establishing signs, using signs carefully, clearly, putting aside, as the Satipatthana said, covetousness, dejection, or craving, and um, despond in terms of the sensory realm, that which you cultivate to do that, and then that listening to the silences. Just remember that the way we even consider the mind is we generally use various metaphors such as visual ones, seeing, watching, being clear, and that has particular strengths in terms of uh, pinpointing clarity. But it's not very good for um, letting go. It's good for sharpening and pinpointing. It's not so good at letting, letting things pass because it seeks an object. We can use metaphors of the mind like listening, which is a little more... Uh, less object clear, you can, that allows one to be present with thoughts and feelings, listening to the sound, listening to the movement of listening to the sound of it, the flux of it. It's quite good for letting things pass over a certain sense of detachment. And the third way we use the mind is feeling it, handling it which is great for letting go because it's exactly what the hand does. It's able to pick things up, put things down. It's a flexing organ. This is very good for letting go. You can just see yourself feel the sense of relinquishing, releasing, dropping, putting aside. It's very much a, like a hand. But some things you shouldn't pick up in the first place. So that's what the, the visual sense, you know, gives you a sense of this is this is really dangerous. This is something you put it's gonna stick to you, this is gonna burn. Touch it once and it well, you don't want to do it, go there again. So that's your your visual sense of mind is good as a kind of um, like a watchman. A scout, see things coming at distance. Because visual things are very good for distance. Mm. Is this okay? Don't know. It seems okay. Doesn't. Mm. Listening, you're starting to take it in. You're really absorbing into it. So that's very good when you have something skillful and you listen into it and you absorb into it. Because listening takes you right in there. Handling it is very good for getting the finer qualities of how you're being affected and also for 
relinquishing, dropping it. So one should begin to be more discerning as to when does a thought become a hindrance, when does a mood, be, when does a concern become a hindrance, when it's stuck, when it's locking, when it's obsessive, when it's driven, it's, you're no longer have any space around it, then whatever it is, it's become a hindrance. It's affected by ill will or craving or restlessness or doubt or dullness, lethargy. Mm. So you don't have, there's no flexibility, you, you're just in that. And there's no uh, processing of it. it. doesn't pass through, it just obsesses. Mm. Now if it doesn't do that, it's not a hindrance, it can have hindrance potential. But it's also something that you can, it's a negative thought, it's like this. Okay. Other people have these kinds of thoughts, negative thoughts. It's based upon this, it's based upon this assumption, this attitude. You investigate it and you're able to, you know, see your way through that. To the point when you can feel yourself almost shifting, putting it down, that wrong attitude, wrong assumption. Why did I ever believe that? That one caught me again. Mm. So these are ways and means to ascertain what is a hindrance. Mm. Over obsessive, not leading to the signless, not leading to releasing. If it's like that, it's not a hindrance. If it's like that, it's, it is a hindrance. So it doesn't do that, it's a hindrance. How we handle it, we witness, we watch, we can bring up another sign, another impression to counteract it. So you contemplate the body, the unattractive aspects of the body. If your mind is obsessed with the attractiveness or the could be attractive, then you contemplate, bring up the sign of the unattractive. Mm. If you have experience of ill will, you bring up the sign of compassion because ill will does me no good, does him no good, does her no good. It's just a further corruption. Mm. So you bring up wisdom and that allows you to return to equanimity or kindness or compassion. Working with signs and to till you get to the place where you can release, let that go in back to, into the into the signless. It's kind of happens through that process. Mm.